Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. You know, the last lecture concerning the parable of the sower and the other parables uh, grouped within that, it's all very important. And in as much as Jesus not speaking in a parable but explaining one when we come to the 37th verse as to how Satan actually, the old devil, actually planted a seed here on earth. And the Greek word is very interesting so that you don't get off in fairy tales. The word in the Greek is sperma, specifically male sperm. And you can check that out in your Strong's Concordance. It's real easy. The word seed in the Greek in the earlier chap verses uh, before verse 24 of this uh, 13th chapter, a different word entirely. But God wanted you to know that ultimately the Word brings in people, and when the Word brings in people, you want to be careful because Satan will always be knocking on the door. And he had instructed, you leave the Kenites alone, which is who the tares are, the children of the wicked one, as reiterated in, in uh, verse 39. And don't let some one verse Charlie rob you of that fact. It's documented in more places than one. The first epistle of John, Cain who was of progeny, that wicked one. Jesus teaching in John chapter 8 verse 44, the first murderer being Cain who was of the, his father was the devil. And um, Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, in the Hebrew, Ish it Yahweh, Eve saying, with the help of God, I got a man child, Cain. And then what most people lose by not being familiar with the Hebrew manuscripts, she continued in labor and gave birth to Abel, meaning they were twins by separate conceptions. You can read of the first conception of Cain in chapter 3, verse 15. Have a go at it and have a good day. There's a great deal written in God's Word that some do not have ears to hear. All right. And it's strange. I had a letter from a person said, why do you always say, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, that my daughter is blind or deaf? I forget which. This is speaking spiritual. Many deaf and blind people have their spiritual eyes wide open. And that's what we're talking about. A person that is handicapped simply by giving a witness for God makes a far greater witness than I because it impresses people that someone with a handicap still believe. That's a powerful witness. Okay, then, so we're going to pick it up. We told them at the end, you leave them alone, but the angels themselves are going to gather the tares, put them in bundles, and we're going to throw them in the lake of fire, and God is that consuming fire. Matthew chapter 13, we continue that same subject. The kingdom of heaven be sharp for me. A word of wisdom in Yeshua's name, verse 40 of Matthew 13 and it reads and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth a lot of people that thought they were on the road to heaven and were too lazy to study God's word to show themselves approved were deceived in that last moment by none other than the enemy spoken of in verse 39 himself as the spurious Messiah. And then they expect to go to heaven after jumping in the sack with Satan. I don't think so. When he comes here preaching rapture, going to fly you away. And they go right with him. You'll learn more of that when we get to the 24th chapter. Don't be deceived. Okay, verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. That's where you want to go, the king and his dominion? I hope so. 
Who hath ears to hear, let him hear, and there it is written. And naturally this speaks of spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. Sometimes you have to close your flesh eyes even to open your spiritual eyes. Sometimes you have to close your um, flesh ears so that your spiritual ears can hear the Word of God with understanding. Verse 44. He gives us another angle here, another side view. Again, the kingdom of heaven, he's telling you what it's like. The king, his dominion of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. We already know the field is the world, okay? That was, uh, Christ described that in, um, in verse 38, okay? In the field, which, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. In other words, there's nothing more important than God's truth. It is so vain. It's your membership into the kingdom if you obey. It's your membership in the kingdom of heaven. And there's nothing of this field, meaning this world, which Satan basically is the prince of the air, there's nothing in it that compares to the value of God's love for his children, that great king. 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Verse 46, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. He wanted it. Nothing, nothing comes before truth. Nothing comes before understanding. Nothing, you know why? You know, um, the reason God's truth is so valuable that when, when you love him and you let him know you love him, he blesses you the rest of your life here today. If you deserve it, if you earn it, he, has, he knows what you have need of. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to give you something that's going to get you in trouble, all right? You start praying for stuff that'll get you in trouble or has nothing to do with the plan of God. But that's why it is such a treasure. Now, in another place, Christ will say, do not cast your pearls before swine. This, in a sense, goes back as to why Christ spoke in parables, spake in parables, whereby uh, people of the world, they're not going to understand, nor will they really care a great deal. That's why the pearls are hidden within the parables, the parable of the sower, the parable of the tares. Do you see that pearl? Then if you see that pearl, don't cast it before swine because they will rend it and press it into the mire. And his word is too precious for that. Take it, share it with those that are deserving. That is to say, when you plant seeds, if the embryo sprouts, water it, care for it. God's truth is worth more than anything in the world. That is to say, the understanding because of the blessings that come with it, not only here, but forever. Nothing, nothing comes before the truth of God's word. Verse 47, we're going to go again here and again. The kingdom of heaven, that's the king, his dominion, and heaven itself. Is that where you want to go? Well, listen up is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, 48, which when it was full, they drew to shore and, and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Now, uh, you are told in God's word, truth, which is what we're talking about, you do not partake of scavengers. So when you brought the net in, 
you divided that that God created to be partaken of in one uh, gathering and you threw the scavengers away. You got rid of them because they were not edible. And um, this is the analogy that we have. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Some we're going to keep, that is to say God is going to keep, and some are going to be very unclean. And guess what he's going to do with them? Verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. You want to know what it's going to be like there. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. There's going to be a separation. 50. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Why? A lot of people have listened to one verse revolving rev so long in traditions of men that they don't understand actually, aside from salvation, the working plan of God. Your works are not going to save you. But let me ask you something. You claim to love the Lord, and it would seem that some people have such a, a um, built-in um, rheostat to turn anyone off that says you've got to know a little about God's letter. He wrote the letter to you. If you love him, how can you but help want to absorb the letter, the information, the telling you how to avoid pain, the, the letter telling you how to be successful? Why, why wouldn't you want to understand in detail? And then it makes it very clear why that Jesus would say in the book of Matthew as well as Mark, especially in Mark, if you don't understand this parable, I could even go one step further. If you don't understand this group of parables because they're all one. Do you want me to say that again? This group of parables that we have covered are all one. It's just one parable. If you don't understand it, you're not going to understand anything about God's Word, the other parables. Thus, separating those that have eyes to see and ears to hear from those that do not. Right out of the sack, right out of the net. The fiery furnace, of course, is the lake of fire written of in Revelation chapter 20. That's the time of the division. Satan, the old evil one, the enemy, spoken of in verse 39, is the first to enter. Why? He's already been judged. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. 51, verse 51. Jesus said unto them, Have ye understood all these things? Question. What, did he say some of these things? No. All these things. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Verse 52, listen carefully. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. So, well, things new and old what? Well, the Old Testament seals the new, and the new completes the old. You have to have both. As well as every scribe or disciple, one instructed, a pupil, must be able to pull knowledge and wisdom from God's Word. And um, so it is. Verse 53, to complete the thought, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. Now, what, what, I want to, what I want you to see, the word finished, that means it, it is showing that the, the um, many are one of a whole. Okay? In other words, it takes all the parables given in this setting, this teaching, is not a group of parables, but it is all one whole. And I hope that you have the understanding to realize that it takes from the Word of God being sown in this world, 
and how that Satan made his move back in beginning with verse 24 to alter God's plan whereby this one, Messiah, Jesus Christ, could not have come through woman because he tried to pollute the woman. And within that, the seed was set forth and the kingdom never changed. But you must understand the overall working plan of God because he's telling you what the kingdom of heaven, not earth, the kingdom of heaven, because wherever God is, is heaven, whether it's earth or wherever, okay? He will ultimately be right here, but that hasn't happened yet. He's here in spirit, yes. Anyway, that he has instructed you as to what it's like to be a householder. I don't know, do you ha are you a householder in the kingdom or are you not? I hope you're not one of these that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know where you can read of them? Do you know where they lose it? Revelation chapter 9. When the spurious Messiah comes first preaching the rapture doctrine, his wagon is going to fill up in a hurry because of the miracles because somebody forgot to tell some that the false messiah comes first before the second advent or our gathering back to Christ. It's, it's really a mystery because Paul, I mean with emphasis, reiterated in Second Th uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 that don't let some spirit, some man, any of Paul's letters or anyone else deceive you that Christ will not gather back to us or we to him until after this enemy, the evil one, stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God and Christ. Come to fly you away. Or have you been taught that? Well then if you haven't, I guarantee you, you're gonna, you've got some gnashing of teeth ahead of you. Sorry Charlie, there's some that won't make it, that think they're in good standing. Do I rejoice in that? Certainly not. That's why I've dedicated my life to teaching the manuscripts whereby people are not deceived by false teachings, the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. It is so important that you pick up on the word finished in this 53rd verse because it ties all of these as a whole. It makes them one. You've got to understand all of them. Then that's no problem because basically they're all in the same. It's the same message using different analogies as to what the kingdom is like. It even uses different professions in case you happen to be in this uh, uh, profession, farmer, merchant, um, and so forth. Okay, uh, okay, verse 54, we continue then. Don't ever forget those parables and never forget the simplicity in which they're given and put a value on God's word for indeed it is valuable. 54, and when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. Hey, he didn't hide, okay? Went right to the church in so much that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? I, I mean, he grew up right down the road there, okay? I mean, they'd known him all of his life when he was just a little shaver right on up. And look at him. Listen to him. 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Question to, he, you know, these people are carpenters. Is not his mother called Mary, little old Mary, you know, that was there, bless her heart, chosen of God? And his brethren, James and, and uh, Joseus, or Hoseus and Simon and Judas? I mean, we saw them play out there in the yard. They grew up here. Why is he with all this knowledge? 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Question. They're part of us. 
Whence then hath this man all these things? Question. You know, it is true that if you see the earthly side of a man, it's very difficult to see the spiritual message and gifts that God might give him to share, okay? You know, and um, uh, Christ is making this point well, okay? Verse 57, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save or except in his own country and in his own house. The, the word offended here is skandaezo in the Greek, which our word scandalize comes from. It, it seems that uh, our people just cannot uh, except um, uh, a family member, as a matter of fact, as for, now there's exceptions to every rule, of course, but believe me, it's very difficult where you grew up. If God gives you a masterful gift of teaching to be accepted by those that saw you in your daily life, daily chores, and so forth, especially a carpenter, you know, carpenters are usually not theologians. Carpenters, well, that's not true, really. I don't want to talk down to carpenters, but you understand where I'm coming from. I mean, it just so happens, though, that Mary was chosen of God to be the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I suppose what I want to say is, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, it doesn't matter who you are. If God chooses you, if God uses you, and, and this certainly is a pittance compared to the Son of God, the only begotten. I'm not talking uh, on that level, but down to our level, the lesson for you, we are to follow him. Understand, if God gives you a gift where you're to use it, if you choose to be successful, you will not find it necessarily among your own, all right? It holds to be true. Uh, the next verse then, we come to finish the chapter 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Why? You have to have faith before um, God will answer your request, or, meaning a healing or whatever the case. The individual must have faith. Unbelief is the cousin to faith. You can't have unbelief because if you have unbelief, you're going to be an unfather. Okay? You're not a fader. And if you doubt God, certainly he's not going to help you. He shouldn't. You've got to let you wallow in the mire until you finally come to your senses to realize there are better things in life than to walk around in a stupor all your life. Because many of you have a purpose, you have a destiny, you have a calling into truth and understanding which brings you your reward, peace of mind, whereby you can acquire that treasure by finding it in his letter in his word and by the Holy Spirit to receive gifts from God of understanding whereby you can be blessed and have a good life even with troubles in this earth age. I thank our Father for that. I think I will not say a great deal more about those parables because those that understand will understand and those that do not will not. But never give up. Continue and pray for wisdom from our Father. But lest I um, frighten someone in indecision, they're simple. A child can understand. It simply means God's truth is the most precious thing in the world and that Satan will take it all away from you if you allow him. It's that simple. I can sum it up with those words. Chapter 14 and verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, fourth ruler, heard of the fame of Jesus. Boy, it's, it's rolling, all right? Verse 2. And he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. 
and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Herod always had this thing with John. I think old Herod kind of liked John. I know at least he admired him. I have no doubt about that. Uh, it was not Herod's wish to have John beheaded, as a matter of fact. His, his uh, drunken stupor and love for his stepdaughter got him into that. But um, he cared for old John. And yet at the same time, he was kind of afraid of John. Listen to the report. Verse 3, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias, Dias, that would be his wife, sake, his brother Philip's wife. And he kind of took his brother Philip's wife, Philip being lover of horses and so forth, and Herodotus being um, um, actually a hero appearance. She must have been a dandy, huh? I guess she was because of her taste. Verse 4, For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Verse 5, And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. He was, Herod was afraid to put a sentence when he got on his case about taking his brother's wife away from him and marrying her or living with her, whatever the case was. John was not bashful. He spoke out. Verse 6, And when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Oh, Salome, she danced. Oh, she was quite a dancer. Here, we got his birthday. He's probably about three sheets in the wind. You know what that means, verse 7. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. I mean, he was feeling good and making points with the little thing. Verse 8. And she being before instructed of her mother. In other words, it was a plot. Who do you think was behind this plot? It was Satan, of course. Instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. That's a basket. That jolted him. Verse 9. And the king was sorry. He hated it. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, he couldn't go back on that, see. And them that sat with him at meat, his high cronies, you know. I mean, they're all drunk. He gave his word. He's not going to go back on it. He commanded it to be given her. Verse 10. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, 11. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. Happy birthday, darling. Now you can see what kind of people that um, there are of the world. What makes them that way? Well, some of them are pretty on me all on their own, but Satan wanted John done away with. John had talked about Satan's little children when they came down to the stream and accused him. This is to say Kenites parading as Pharisees and Sadducees. And he said, you wicked generation, you offspring of the devil. He called them what they were. Of the asp, if I remember right, is what he said, which is a snake, serpent. The, the word in the Hebrew back in the beginning of Genesis is the upright one. So that you, the, and only serpent because of the glistening, shining one. Okay? Matter of fact, the old pilgrim Bible translated it the shining one, not snake, because of the original manuscripts. Verse 12. And his disciples came, now that's John's disciples, not Christ's and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Do you think he, they had to? No, he already knew. Our Father knows everything. 
Yeah, happy birthday, Herod. I would hate to be in Herodias' place when it comes judgment day. I would hate to have to answer for what she's going to answer for. And you know something? She sits on the other side of that gulf right now, dreading that day. Good for her. Good for her to be there. 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. They sought him. His, he, I mean, he was healing people that there was no um, bomb or healers for. Paralyzed, blind. And he was successful. How, do you think the word didn't get around? 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, bunch of them, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Uh, I'll tell you right now, there was about 10,000 of them, and I'll document that, pro and that's very probably conservative. There was probably near 12,000. Verse 15, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves vessels. In other words, the word evening here is the first evening, and it's about 3 p.m. There's no quick trips, no restaurants, no grocery stores. We're in the desert. These people are going to, I mean, there's a, about 10,000 of them. We got to do something. And, you know, right to use common sense, nothing, nothing wrong with that, okay? But this is your lesson on feeding people, so don't miss one word of it. 16. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Now, naturally, what is the bread of life? Well, it's Christ himself. And what is the fish symbolic of? The cipher is uh, Christianity, okay? Verse 17. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. Five is what in biblical numerics? It's grace. Christ's grace can save the whole bunch of them. Christ's grace can feed the whole bunch of them. And of course, the two, two fishes, fish always standing for Christians. Uh, it was the sign that the early disciples would place on a door, meaning Christians are meeting here because of the cipher in the language, which would read, uh, being ciphered, Jesus Christ, Savior of Israel, okay? And uh, that being the Christian sign, 18. And he said, bring them hither to me, 19. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. <clears throat> Take all this in now. And took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, always give thanks, beloved. He blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples the multitude. Now, I'm going to ask you in closing, did Christ feed the multitude? In another place, it stipulates the order of it, that he set them down in 50s. <clears throat> set them down in 50s. No mob. It's got to be order. Christ did not feed them. He only blessed that that they were partake of. He being the bread... And it was the disciples that fed the multitude. They fed them what? That that Christ had presented. That's what you do today. You feed the multitude. But Christ has blessed us with the bread of life. And I like to think of those two fishes of Smyrna and Philadelphia. Symbolic of the two churches that really teach the truth. The only two out of seven in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that Christ was happy with. 
I don't know, are you in a church that teaches what Smyrna and Philadelphia taught? If not, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Well, I'm not sure. Well, you'd better be for finding out if you care for your soul. If you want God's blessings, you will find that really Smyrna and Philadelphia understood the parable of the tares because they knew those that were of the synagogue of Satan that claimed to be our brother Judah, meaning the tares to save Kenites. If it's not taught in your church, I'm sorry, Christ probably isn't happy with you, and I'm not judging. He gave you seven churches and the method that they used in teaching, and only two was he pleased with. I hope that you're in one that teaches what those two taught. You have the two to compare. You see what they both taught is what made him happy. I hope that you're in it. I hope you're intelligent enough to know, whoa, I better get with the program. Okay, we're gonna pick this up in the next lecture. This feeding, there's a great deal of knowledge that he imparts to you. It affects you if you find that pearl to at least let people look upon it. That pearl is truth. God's truth, not man's. That is to say, in planting seeds and sharing to feed that true bread of life. As it is written in Amos chapter 8, verse uh, 13 or 15, which is it, 13, that the famine in the end times will not be for bread, but for hearing the word of God. Do you hear it? All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?